I think we'll get started now. So first of all, thank you everybody for coming. I know it's a little bit dark in this room. It's a little bit late, so coffee's running out and we're all a little bit tired. So I'll do my best to kind of give you as much in interesting information as I can and hopefully make it of value for everybody. Um, so my name is Roland Grumberg. I'm a software developer at Red Hat on the IDE services team. And the main focus of this talk is going to be on basically how we wanted to open up parts of JDT so that they could be consumed by um, you know, JDTLS, Java Development Tools Language Server, and potentially other um, consumers. Now, um, I think this is a theme that's quite common these days at Eclipse. We see a lot more web IDEs, and I think we're all thinking it would be a real shame if um, all the hard work that has gone into these classic Eclipse plugins was kind of just thrown away and wasn't reused, because there's a lot of good stuff in there over the years, a lot of difficult bugs that have been fixed. Um, at the same time, I'm also approaching this as a relatively new committer to um, JDT. So I started contributing probably at the start of 2018, and then maybe around the end of 2018, start of 2019, I became a committer. Um, obviously, when your first motivation to contribute to a project is basically to just refactor a bunch of stuff, without really adding any additional value, um, there can be a bit of friction, and it's understandable because you're not really adding anything. You're just doing something for yourself. Um, but over time, myself, oh, this is a little bit better, actually. <laughs> but um, basically, over time, myself and uh, my colleague Jeff Johnston came to realize that uh, fixing bugs in JDT, uh, helping with reviews, getting in features that have kind of um, not really had been addressed so much is actually a good thing, and it keeps the project in better shape. And um, that ultimately benefits other IDEs in some sense as well. So um, the first thing I'd like to say is there definitely is a demand for Java support. I mean, the situation in Eclipse is such that, um, you know, even in this conference uh, today and yesterday, I was hearing people saying, I'll use this uh, IDE for this language support, this for that. But of course, for Java, I use Eclipse. So we can even look at the marketplace, and we see a lot of the top entries are still related to a Java-specific workflow. I'm a little surprised to see Subclips up there, but I mean, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, no judgment or anything. Um, if we look on the left, though, we can see that the situation for the Microsoft uh, Visual Studio marketplace, specifically Visual Studio Code, is such that the Java language support is one of the highest ones. And in addition to that, we can see there's other plugins kind of related to Java um, workflow. So there definitely is a demand for other IDEs to consider Java language support. Um, just as a quick overview of how um, the language server protocol works, specifically with uh, um, JDTLS. So on the left there, we can see the language server clients. So they can be VS Code, uh, Eclipse Che, and as of version 7 of Eclipse Che, you can actually swap out the front end, so you can use Theia. And I personally use that for all my kind of uh, local development testing. Um, so basically, these clients are just communicating using the language server protocol with a uh, language server, in this case, JDTLS. Um, and the language server protocol is really, uh, really well defined. So there's definitions of what kind of requests you can have and um, what the responses can be. So in this case, um, we can see that Che is making a uh, completion request. So that probably has some kind of document reference and an offset. And then the language server is responding with a set of uh, completion items. So in the case of JDTLS, what's actually happening under the hood is it's calling uh, JDT libraries, JDT core, JDT core manipulation. And um, essentially, the way it's actually doing this is um, for a project in the workspace, it's actually calling the Java core, create Java project, and then indexing it. So all of the responses get the benefit of having a fully indexed Java project and being able to do those queries that way. Um, now, you probably saw those question marks there, and that's because there's actually quite a bit of copied code. As you can imagine, uh, the JDT probably didn't imagine that many, many years later, they'd have to provide some of these capabilities outside of the UI. And so, uh, for a large part, uh, JDTLS was actually copying over certain portions that they really cared about and wanted to use, and didn't want to wait around for them to uh, kind of be um, take, stripped out from the UI portion. Um, so some people looking at this, Actually, before that, uh, the way it actually works, if uh, a package has no dependence to JDT UI at all, if it's core manipulation or just core, even if it's uh, internal, they're fine with using it as is directly. If it's uh, in JDT UI, generally over the past, they have actually just copied it over, stripped out what they didn't care about, 
and used it that way. Um, we're definitely trying to get them to file more bugs and uh, be a little more open about what, exactly what it is they need so that it can actually be addressed, and we are trying to address it. But some people looking at this might be wondering, well, why even bother trying to strip it out? Just um, bundle all of JDT UI with all of platform UI, get some kind of X11 dummy display server inside some container, and then just you know query for the API and only use what you need. Um, this would be a, a nice solution in the sense of not having to refactor everything, and it would certainly be easier in terms of uh, being able to work on other features, bug fixes, and whatnot. But there are some issues with it. So um, you couldn't really run natively on Windows or Mac OS. Um, well, definitely not on Windows, because you need some kind of dummy um, display server that you could use for all of this. But the more serious issue is right now JDTLS is probably the language server itself, maybe around 40 to 50 megs. Um, if you start adding like a full platform runtime and then a Okay, maybe that's around 80 megs, and then a full JDT uh, runtime, maybe another 30, 40, let's say, for including UI. You're looking at about 100 megs. And when you consider the fact that for every workspace, there's a corresponding language server, so it's not a many-to-one relationship. You have another language server per workspace. It's just a solution that doesn't scale to multiple workspaces, and um, in Che, where you want everything inside a container somewhere, it's, it's not an ideal approach. So um, it would be nice, but um, for now, we really ought to try our best to split out the UI and core capabilities. So now I just want to quickly get into some of the features um, that we're doing. Some we are actually working on, and some um, would be future nice-to-haves. So in terms of quick fixes, assists, cleanup, and save actions, these are fairly common to get pushed into JDT and then have JDT LS consume them. Um, in the screenshot here, I actually have Thea uh, running on the light theme. And um, the convert to enhance for loop one, so um, just taking some for loop or iterating over an index um, over a collection and then converting it to a regular for each style loop. Um, so this was a feature that went into JDT. I believe Jeff Johnston pushed it in, and then a little while later, it found its way into JDTLS fairly easily. Um, there's still a lot of work to do in this. There's still a bit of copied code, um, but quite a bit of um, the code relating to compilation unit rewrite or certain kinds of um, cleanup fixes, a lot of that has been uh, refactored such that there's less copied code in uh, JDTLS. So these are fairly straightforward, and there's it's kind of an incremental change because there's many kinds of quick fixes and assists um, that can evolve over time, and so they're useful. So before I get into more features, I just wanted to address a question some people may have, which is, why even bother? So um, obviously, we have Eclipse Marketplace. We have different um, plugins and capabilities shipping you know, separately outside the Eclipse Foundation. So why not just use them? Um, why bother this, with this whole exercise of trying to merge everything? Because it takes more effort. Um, and the reason is because, simply, if you have some language-specific feature, like JDT, and then you have all these peripheral kind of nice additions, like code recommenders or uh, post-fix completion or all these things, generally, users aren't going to say, oh, I need to go here to get it, I need to go there. They're just going to assume it doesn't exist. That's generally what happens. I mean, you can think about all the people who have JDT but don't have code recommenders, or all the people that have JDT but don't have um, post-fix completion as a separate feature. So the general situation is they will assume it doesn't exist. Um, I know from my personal experience, actually, that um, for quick assist, I was actually thinking, oh, it would be really nice if um, it had like a little light bulb on the side to indicate um, that there's a possible quick assist in Eclipse. And then I checked Windows Preferences, and it's actually an option. It's right there. So that's an example of a feature that's just disabled, and it's in Eclipse. And if it's difficult to find it, you can only imagine uh, how much more difficult it is when a feature is being shipped somewhere else. And the other advantage to this is that you kind of merge communities together. So um, basically, instead of, having a, um, instead of having some kind of situation where you have the language-specific community and various features, and they're disjoint. By merging them together, you get experts from both. You have people on JDT that could definitely make important changes into chain completion or post-fix completion. And you have people from those projects who probably know a little bit about JDT and would be willing to fix bugs here and there. So it's a benefit in that sense as well. Um, so I just wanted to quickly mention this. It's not implemented yet. It's probably somewhere on the backlog. But the idea is... Um, so spot bugs was formerly known as find bugs, and it was essentially providing static analysis checkers 
Um, it could be run as a standalone application, as a Maven plugin, and they had their own um, Eclipse plugin. And it was really nice because it had a, like something like 400-ish uh, different checkers. Some of them were really interesting too. So um, there was one for something like uh, if you use URL.equals, it warned you that that could potentially be a DNS lookup. And so you might want to avoid using that. Just a lot of really interesting ones, some very specific, some very general. Um, and so I thought it would be really good to get something like this into JDT, just the different types of checkers. Um, the issue is that um, can't copy the source code because it's LGPL. Um, even if we had it as a third-party library, I'm pretty sure it's not using JDT API to do the static analysis. So ultimately, what you ideally would be looking at is someone porting over 400 or so different static analysis checkers using JDT API. As you can imagine, that's a pretty soul-crushing task. Um, but the thing is, um, without enough resources, it's, it can be a little tricky to want to have to go through this. But it could be a really um, nice feature. And there are some potentially um, useful entry points within the code base uh, to implement something like this. So next, I'll get into the main ones, chain completion and post-fix completion. Um, in both cases, it was fairly straightforward to get these in. It was just a matter of um, switching over to proper JDT API as opposed to the internal, uh, internal AST node and internal uh, bindings. Um, in the case of chain completion, some of you might remember that um, it was actually part of something called Eclipse Code Recommenders. Um, over time, uh, the project had difficulties, I think, keeping up with the Simrel release. Um, there weren't as many people contributing, and so it ultimately uh, got retired. I figured it would be a shame if no one used a lot of the useful tooling in there. So I looked into at least uh, porting over chain completion. And um, it was pretty straightforward. It, wasn't, it took a bit of time. It wasn't super complicated. Um, there's still plenty of work to be done to improve it, but it's in uh, JDT 4.13. And um, yeah, it's, it's another case of um, just communities kind of coming together. Because initially, no one really wanted to look at it or do the work, um, initial work to get it in. But once they saw there's an actual good chance of this making its way, um, people started contributing test cases, testing it out. Um, yeah, and it was the same thing for post-fix uh, post completion as well. It actually was a separate uh, plugin in a separate update site. Um, there was an initial contribution by Nikolai Hayes uh, to get it in, but I think he became a little inactive, and ultimately the change kind of uh, stalled. So I just took it on, and um, it's kind of the same situation. I began to see that people, again, wanted to improve it, propose test cases, and uh, Nikolai Hayes even became active afterwards and made some changes to it, which was really nice. Um, so this one, uh, this particular feature is in 4.14, uh, M1. So chain completion is basically just um, in the context of a certain return type, um, navigating through all the local variables and jumping members that are visible to get back to a certain return type. Um, you wouldn't want to use a chain just like that, just because of null pointers and uh, thrown exceptions, but it does give you a, an idea of how you can use a particular API when you don't immediately know that API. And postfix completion is, of course, just taking certain expressions and being able to apply a template without breaking your typing um, pace. So I'd like to just quickly show you a demo of chain completion um, in Thea. So just as a quick background on this. Um, so the way I actually built this, I took uh, platform text, so org.eclipse.txt and org.eclipse.jface.txt, built them with some modifications. Then I built JDT UI core manipulation on top of that with some modifications. Then I took VS Code Java, sorry, then I took JDT LS and built that through VS Code Java. It's sort of how um, the extension is built. And once I had all that, I essentially had a plugin that I could feed to Thea. And it was, it was pretty straightforward. I was actually impressed how easy it worked. Um, some of the documentation wasn't there, but it wasn't too difficult. So I'll just, um, let's make this a little bigger, though it's not too necessary to see it. So I'll just go into examples browsers, and I'll start up the application. Okay, so I'll just have to find a web browser. Actually, is it? Yeah. Let me 
Let's see if we can make this a little bigger. So I'll just open up a project here that I already have set up. Okay, that should be a little better. Okay, so let's actually try the example that uh, was on the slide. So it was something like input stream INP equals, oh, there we go. Actually need to have it resolved. Uh, URI dot create. And we can see some of the chain completion options here. So this is, it's not like fully complete, ready to be submitted, but it's, it's an idea behind what we're trying to do. We want to get all these features into JDTLS. And the reason I'm using Thea is just to show you that I could have just as easily used a VS Code, uh, VS Code job, sorry, VS Code. And it probably would have worked just the same, but I can use Thea um, because it's just a language server at the end of the day and Thea supports VS Code extensions. So I can essentially just navigate here and it's not fully complete. There's still a lot of issues with it, but you can kind of see that we're committed to definitely getting a lot of JDT features into JDTLS and hopefully having them in Thea as well and other IDEs. So I'll just close this. And move on. Okay, so the next feature, which is actually, um, there's a patch of it on Garrett and it's, I think as part of me discussing it here, I've pretty much uh, committed to actually reviewing it. Um, it was done by Mikhail Istria. And the basic idea behind it is it's more for Eclipse, but the idea is to get Eclipse to the stage where a lot of IDEs are, which is that I'm sure you've all noticed when you, do, when you hit an invocation to complete something, it can be a little sluggish. And admittedly, one of the features I had, uh, chain completion, actually is contributing to this to some extent because it, it takes a lot of processing power. Well, it takes a lot of processing to do what it needs to do. Um, but the idea behind asynchronous completion is you could continue to do your completions, continue typing, and not notice any noticeable lag or anything like that. You can escape, you can do pretty much anything. Um, so that's what's currently in right now. In fact, one of the um, additions that are planned, I believe Mikhail has already addressed, uh, just to make it easier to enable, even when other features that don't support it are present. And um, the final stage is ultimately to make it so that completions can um, populate that pop-up um, at various times. Um, right now, it's just not there yet, but that's the ultimate goal. But just having completions that don't hang the UI is a step in the right direction. Okay, so now I'll get into some issues um, to consider. Obviously, with initiatives like this, when you're contributing a lot of new features, there can be a lot of things you overlook, a lot of things that um, you uncover. So one of the ones with um, a lot of the proposal, uh, the completion proposal categories, was the fact that initially we wanted to disable some of them just to make them sort of experimental. But um, due to some issues with that um, particular part of the API, it was a little difficult to do. And we ended up in situations where um, you have some new features, but the user hasn't um, seen them, so they're not on their enablement, sorry, they're not on their disablement list, so they get enabled by default. Um, but it's something that can be worked through. And obviously, uh, we want to increase the number of contributors to JDT. And uh, the time spent uh, reviewing these contributions can be quite a bit. It's not just um, looking at a particular contribution and seeing it fixes a bug and it's, um, it's reasonably good. There's a lot of other things to consider, um, especially as a relatively new committer. You kind of don't, you might not know the code base fully, uh, fully. So sometimes you're just learning as you go and looking for proper ways that things should be done and then taking that and comparing with how a particular contributor has done them. Um, and obviously we need more contributors. So we're trying to be a little more proactive in looking at people who aren't um, committers, at least to show them that um, we are willing to take their changes seriously. And um, there's a good chance that if they put in good effort and are listening to feedback, then they'll probably get in. Um, but it's kind of a bit of a balancing act. So obviously if the feature is almost there or if a particular bug is sort of where it needs to be, we're willing to maybe push it in and do a little bit of the work after the fact. But at the same time, we do have to be a little picky sometimes in terms of making sure something is of a good standard. And at the same time, we also want to make life easier for committers on JDT. And part of that means trying to automate uh, a lot more things. So um, with more features or more bugs coming in from contributors, um, 
the Garrett uh, verification instance can often be overwhelmed, just rebuilding things, rebuilding things that depend on other things. And you could be looking at 24 hours of just waiting for your change to uh, get verified. So um, in light of that, we, as a community, I guess, decided to go with a rebase if necessary approach, which makes it a little easier to get your changes in. You don't have to be uh, like a fast forward change where you're the top one on top of origin master. Um, and obviously something that even I've uh, kind of dropped the ball on is uh, making sure that there are no uh, compiler warnings uh, that are introduced. So for some reason, for a while, I just assumed if I don't see any compiler warnings when I'm actually in the Eclipse uh, IDE, then you know, assume that there haven't been any introduced. But um, the ideal way to do it is to actually run Maven locally um, with a particular flag. But as soon as that flag is usable, we should be putting in our, in our verification instance and essentially making sure that it's the job of the contributor now um, to fix these things more easily because they can easily see it in the logs. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of other things we could probably be doing, um, but anything to sort of get more contributors and make life easier for existing committers so that they can work on other things as well is um, a step in the right direction. Okay, so don't worry if you can't really read this slide. I will sort of explain it. I'm hoping you can sort of see the avatars a little bit from left to right. So on both sides, we essentially have, um, so on the left, we have um, Garrett changes that have been merged into JDT UI between uh, mid-July to October of 2018 on the left. So it roughly corresponds to 2018 uh, dash 09 all the way into 2018 dash 12 M1. And it's the same thing on the right. It's 2019 dash 09 into 2019 dash 12 M1. Um, but I'm hoping what you can see is that since a year ago, we definitely have a lot more different committers that are contributing. And obviously, it's not the most scientific graph. You know, people can be away, people can be doing other things. But I'm hoping you can see that there's a lot more contributors now. Um, and that makes life easier for everybody if we have people addressing bugs and other minor things because it leaves other committers to do other features, uh, doing latest Java support, things like that. So um, I feel we're going in the right direction and we're definitely trying to get more people interested and in contributing to JDT. All right, so um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I just put a little link on there for um, new features that will be in 4.14, so 4.14, I should probably say, and you can check them out there. Um, and be sure to rate the talks. It's how the program committee can pretty much figure out what worked well, what didn't, and go from there. So um, thank you very much, and if you have any questions, hopefully I can answer them. Yes. To continue to do this. I think the main strategy right now is just we have to refactor more things. There's a lot of um, things like uh, completion proposals that just depend on a lot of things that are UI related. And it's not necessarily that um, they depend on UI. They depend on getting the active editor and getting a certain text selection somewhere. It's like. Um, there's a certain interface and it requires as a return value an SWT image. And so you're pretty much just refactoring that and then you're looking into various other parts of the code. Um, and it, it can quickly balloon out of control to where there's a lot of classes that need to have things split out. And yeah, it's, it's easier in some places, I would say, for quick fixes. I know there were a lot more classes that were refactored that made life a little easier. Um, it definitely helps to have more people. I will actually say that um, we have had a lot of contributions as well um, from Microsoft on the JDTLS side in terms of um, refactoring things in JDT. So that's helped quite a bit as well. Yeah, but it's, it's a lot of work to do and just takes time. Uh, more questions? Yes. Yes. 
As far as I understand, yes, because um, JDTLS essentially has to, at the very least, build an index of everything. So it's it's stored in that Equinox Eclipse instance there, yeah. Yeah, if it's too big. There's there's definitely some things that can go wrong for sure. And it's one of the reasons I really would have loved for the ability to just have some like fake UI giant image thing and just send everything to it and then you don't have to worry so much about all the refactoring. Um, but yeah, at least at the very least, being able to keep it small is um, definitely a concern. Uh, in addition to that, we have received um, not requests, I would say, to figure out how to make the idea of this language server more shareable. So um, as you mentioned, because indices can grow out of control, they would have loved to have a situation where um, you have multiple workspaces, but if the target platform or any jars look even kind of similar, they should, the capability to share indices sort of is in JDT. Um, there's ways of doing it. I believe we've talked about it. It's, it's definitely doable. Um, it's something I'm going to look into for sure. So hopefully it'll yield smaller um, indices in JDT core metadata and yeah. Yeah, but there's just a lot of things that can be tried out and they need to be done, yeah. Um, more questions? All right, if that's all, thank you so much for coming.